any time you want, Paul. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all for joining tonight's virtual forum with Brenda Siegel, our 2022 Democratic nominee for the governor of Vermont. I'm Paul Perkins. Uh, I'm the chair of the Stratford uh, Democratic Committee, and I'll be your host tonight. At tonight's forum, you'll meet Brenda Siegel, get to understand her priorities for Vermont, and how they compare to Phil Scott's. And importantly, you get to ask your own questions. We'll start with some acknowledgements, and then I'll briefly introduce Brenda, who will give a more detailed introduction and speech. Afterward, we'll follow up with questions from Brenda that were posed before tonight's virtual forum and questions from you. Please post your questions in the chat screen on YouTube and time permitting, I hope to get to all of your questions tonight. Uh, before I introduce Brenda, I want to acknowledge the work of a number of people who made this virtual forum possible. They are the Town Democratic Committees of Norwich, uh, Linda Gray, the chair, uh, of Sharon, Margaret Gilmore, the chair, of Stratford, and of Thetford, uh, Sherry Merrick is the chair. Uh, this virtual forum could not take place without the expertise of Bob Farnham, who is simultaneously managing this forum for the organizers through Zoom and broadcasting it on YouTube. Now, uh, Brenda Siegel. Brenda was born in Brattleboro, and she grew up the child of a small business owner. Her father was a photographer, her mother a dancer, and American Sign Language interpreter. She spent her childhood as a competitive figure skater, and she was very active in her community and especially in her school, where, as she told me earlier tonight, she joined all of the clubs and did all of the activities. She's a graduate of Brattleboro Union High School, and she began her political work as an intern for Bernie Sanders in Washington, D.C. in 2001. She teaches leadership civic engagement and social justice courses in extracurricular and after-school settings at several schools in Vermont and throughout the country. And she is particularly proud of her child poverty work, advocacy work on the bag ban in Brattleboro, which was adopted statewide. She's a member of the Vermont Public Transit Advisory Commission, a member of the Vermont Department of Children and Families General Assistance Program Working Group. She's a member leader at Rights and Democracy. She is a member of the National Overdose Crisis Cohort with People's Action. She is a citizens member of the Vermont Legislative Equity Caucus. She's on the board of the Community of Vermont Elders, chair of the New Fane Democratic Committee, delegate to the Wyndham County Committee. She's on the Arts Council of Wyndham County and of Neighborhood Schoolhouse. Her two most recent uh, uh, important uh, activities are advocacy and consulting for issues surrounding the housing and overdose crises in Vermont and throughout the country. That's quite a resume and I've only hit the highlights, but you'll get to hear more about our candidate from governor from Brenda herself. Now it's my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce to you the 2022 Democratic nominee for governor of Vermont, Brenda Siegel. Hi there, thank you so much for having me and that was great, a great introduction, thank you. Uh, I wanna start by just telling folks that when I decided that I was gonna run, I did not know that we would be uh, facing what we are with reproductive liberty. Uh, I, we had signs that that was gonna happen, but I guess I was in a little bit of denial. What, one of the first things I found myself doing was releasing a plan on reproductive liberty here in Vermont in June. Uh, but before I tell you about that plan, I wanna tell you a story. In 2019, I testified on both the reproductive liberty amendment and on the legislation. We sat in the house chamber and we talked uh, telling our most intimate details of our lives. There were young women, there were teenagers, there were people who had been through uh, pre Roe v. Wade times talking about the horrors of not having this liberty. We had pro-lifers, or as I like to call them, forced birthers, yelling at us, saying that what we uh, were doing was 
wrong. And really, while we were telling these most intimate details of our lives, really attacking us for that. When the governor was asked at that time if he was going to sign the bill, he said, I don't know. I'm going to wait and see until it gets to my desk and see all the details. That to me is not a reproductive champion. And I didn't feel safe or protected in that moment. And I, lots of people around me felt the same way. When I look at this moment, I think about the children that I have taught many, many young women and how we should have taken this more seriously, how we should have been more proactive and how we should have done more to prevent this moment because they are the ones that are going to have to live through this. And so the first thing I did uh, when I heard about the Supreme Court decision was sit down and come up with a plan. That plan is a 10 point plan, but I'll give you some of the highlights. We need to ensure that we update our extradition laws so that the people who come here to access reproductive liberty, doctors and medical providers that support those folks and those of us on the ground that support those folks are protected from extradition. We also have to update our fair and impartial policing policy to make sure that our state agencies cannot participate with out-of-state investigations around these same activities. And these need to include gender affirming care and LGBTQ rights like marriage equality because those are close behind in the erosion of our liberties. We need to also pass and have signed paid family and medical leave for people who carry a pregnancy to term. It has to be mandatory paid family and medical leave. And we need to build a coalition with the states around us so that in the event of a federal ban, as was introduced in the Senate, in the US Senate last week, in the event of a federal ban where our constitution will not protect us, we are ready and have a plan for how we will protect people's liberties. And again, these liberties have to include LGBTQ rights, contraception, and gender affirming care. If we don't include those, then we aren't being proactive. Pro-choice is just not enough right now. We have to be proactive. On October 14th of this past year, of last year, actually, about a year ago, I stood on the state house steps and I said that I would not leave until the governor fully reinstated the program that emergency housed people experiencing homelessness. I had no idea that I would be there for 27 nights and 28 days. And despite my empathy, I was vastly unaware of the suffering that took place when one is sleeping in the cold, hard ground. I did not know how hard it would be or how quickly I would begin to feel the effects of sleeping rough. And while we were there, right up until that last day, there were many people, I would say most people, that did not think that we could win. And it was not easy, but we won. What I know is that the housing crisis did not start with COVID. It has been building for a long time. It has been barreling at us and we need leadership on that issue. Our neighbors and community members have nowhere to go from folks experiencing homelessness to upper middle income families. There is no housing in this state and we can't just put together a plan that looks good on paper. It has to meaningfully address the needs from everything from emergency to transitional to permanent housing, from rental regulations to protections to home ownership, from land use to transportation. And this plan must center our most marginalized and include our rural communities who are last in line right now to find a path to permanent housing. We cannot talk about housing without talking about what happened just about a week ago. The governor's administration announced that they will be cutting off 8,411 rental assistance vouchers through VRAP by December 1st, and that they will begin to decrease those vouchers as of October 1st. Most of these people did not even get 30 days notice. They also are going to uh, stop taking applications for the transitional housing program for people who have found themselves in homelessness as of the end of September. It's really important to understand that these folks were given 15 to 18 months in these, um, with these vouchers and now they're being ripped away from them. The rug is being pulled out from under them early and we have no plan to make sure these folks can survive through the winter here in Vermont. 
I don't know how you make a mistake like that and throw it on the most marginalized people in this state. That's not something that should have ever happened. They're saying that the reason it happened is because, and we'll get into more of this later, but they're saying that the reason that it happened is because they didn't know how much they were spending and they just didn't have it write, written down. Those are both quotes. I believe that an administration should have a clear plan and should keep clear data and should follow that data. As many of you know, and some of you may not, on March 8th of 2018, my nephew, Kaya Siegel, whose upbringing I was a big part of, died of an overdose. And he was the son of my brother who died just over 20 years before him, also while using heroin. They both suffered from bipolar disorder and severe trauma. And with 20 years between them, the supports were still not in place to make it possible for them to survive. Since that time, I have traveled around the state and country doing work on drug policy. For three years, I worked with elected leaders from all three parties to pass a science and data-driven policy to decriminalize buprenorphine, the life-saving medication for people with opioid use disorder. The governor and his administration resisted this policy despite the overwhelming evidence that it was safe and effective. The bill passed with huge amounts of tripartisan support, Republican, Democrat, and progressive, making it possible, impossible for it to do anything other than become law. That happened alongside families like my, aunt, my own who have buried their loved ones and people in active use and recovery. I didn't do it alone. It was an uphill battle, but we won. What I know is that we have to focus on harm reduction first, treatment and recovery on demand, including medically assisted treatment on demand, dual diagnosis support and criminal justice reform. We are going in the wrong direction and we need leadership on this issue. In 2020, we saw the highest increase in overdose death in the country here in Vermont. And in 2021, we saw the most overdose death in the history of our state and still we're in the top tier for increase in overdose. We have to follow the science, the data and the lived experience experts because there are solutions to this problem and we have to make sure that we are not burying our children. We have to follow science in every way and that includes climate. Climate change is disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable Vermonters and we have solutions. And those solutions go beyond investing one electric vehicle at a time. We have to increase our public transportation. We have to, and I'm on the, as we heard earlier, I'm on the state of Vermont's public transit advisory commission. I have a front row seat to the possibilities we have to expand transit and what we are not doing each year. This year we had more ability to make change due to federal funding, but we again have to ensure that that transportation reaches our rural communities in ways that make it possible to use. We have to ensure that we are working on carbon sequestration, supporting our small farms and making that transition and requiring our large farms to do the same. Our solutions have to reach low and moderate income families because it is mostly low and moderate income families across this state. And one thing that's incredibly important that we have to do is we have to make sure that we change who is on the Public Utilities Commission because the public utility, they, the people that are on the Public Utilities Commission right now are effectively stopping in-state renewable energy build. And we heard from the governor in our debate last week that he is, does not apologize for that because he thinks we have Hydro-Quebec and Hydro-Quebec is good enough. Most of us that understand climate know that Hydro-Quebec is not real renewable energy and that when that contract runs out, those costs are gonna fall onto us Vermonters and we will not be where we need to with our grid or with renewable energy. We are not going to meet our climate goals if we continue down this path. We cannot take two more years of this. COVID was a crisis that we all experienced but it was not the first crisis and it was not the only crisis. There was already a housing crisis. There was already a climate crisis. There was already an overdose crisis. There was already a mental health crisis and we need leadership on those issues. This is going to be a really tough fight, but it's not even close to the toughest fight I've had to face in my life and I am still standing. There are Vermonters all across the state who have to get up 
and work anyways and fight anyways, even though it is hard. And I am inviting all of you to join me to make sure that we can create a state that is brighter and better for our children and for the future of Vermont overall. When I think about what we can do when we move, when we actually come together, we can do anything. That's what I've learned in my life is that when we all come together, we can make real change. Good enough is not enough right now. We have to do better. And that's what it's gonna to take to create a Vermont that works for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, I, we have some questions now, some of which were submitted uh, before uh, tonight's forum. And I expect that we'll have some uh, questions that uh, will be submitted through the YouTube chat room shortly. So why don't we start with the first question, which is about regenerative agriculture. Now, regenerative agriculture has been described generally as uh, farming and grazing in harmony with nature. And the question is, um, do you have a plan to transition towards more regenerative methods of farming and grazing? And if so, can you describe that plan? So uh, I'm gonna start by saying I am not a climate scientist. Uh, my son though is studying agroecology at UVM right now. Uh, and uh, I believe that we have to transition to uh, regenerative agriculture across our state. And as I said in my opening, we have to support our small farms in doing that work and we have to require our large farms too. We can't actually wait. We have to make sure that we are ensuring that we are reducing the tillage and having crop rotation and all of the things that that are included in regenerative agriculture. These things are not only better for our climate, but they also make sure that our farmers are have more income availability for them. They are and they are able to ensure that they it is a, in fact over time, it becomes a more sustainable practice for farmers in addition to it being strong for climate. And so this work overall will make a much better uh, state for farming as well. All right, thank you. Um, we have a number of questions uh, asking you to compare uh, yourself to uh, Governor Scott. And I'll just start with the first one we have. Uh, Governor Scott, recently vetoed a bill with critical updates to Act 250 uh, and a bill to conserve Vermont's biodiversity all in the midst of a climate crisis. Would you please comment on the differences between you and Governor Scott with respect to climate and energy policy? And if you'd like to include in your answer uh, information about the clean heat standard, in-state renewable energy and weatherization, we'd love to hear about those as well. So unfortunately, the clean heat standard actually also came up in our debate the other day. Um, the clean heat standard, what happened there is that the governor had some concerns. He brought them to the legislature. The legislature addressed those concerns in the bill. And then the governor's advisors gave him bad information and he vetoed the bill. And so unfortunately, because he surrounds himself with uh, people who don't quite know the information, uh, then we had to go through a veto override and that lost by one vote. So we need to make sure that we have uh, in our administration, um, when I said I'm not a climate scientist, jokingly, though the truth, uh, we need to make sure that we have climate scientists helping to advise uh, the governor on those issues because that's one of, the, so, and that's what I would commit to in my administration. Uh, I would have signed that bill and I would have in fact been willing to, would the legislature wanted to go a little further, they were addressing his concerns. I would have been willing to go that extra step and make sure that we're moving more quickly towards our 2030 goals uh, because it's too late at 2050. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we're, we're moving to 2030 much faster. Uh, and then the other bill that he, so 
the other thing that we need to make sure, again, is that our in-state renewable energy is possible to be able to be built. So right now, we have, again, a public utilities commission that is packed with people who don't want the build of in-state renewable energy and who are protecting our relationship with Hydro-Quebec, which ultimately harms Vermonters and harms renewable energy. So that's work that we need to do as well. And uh, in addition to that, I would say that though we have moved forward on public transportation, there have been stopping, uh, there have been marks at which we have not been willing to go, which includes getting to our rural communities. And getting out to our rural communities is incredibly essential because it not only supports climate change, but also our low income Vermonters and parents, as well as the aging community who are often isolated at home. So there are many ways that, uh, that we would differ on climate, but I would say one of the most important ways is that I would surround myself and my administration with people who know the science of climate and who could give me strong, good, real advice on climate so that we could go forward um, and meet our, not only meet our goals, but move more aggressively towards meeting those goals. Thank you. Are there differences between you and Governor Scott with respect to reproductive rights? Absolutely. Uh, we talked about these a little too, but we, the biggest difference I would say is that I believe that we have to be proactive in this moment. There are people that are going to be coming from all across the country to access reproductive liberty here, and we need to make sure that they and the people who support them and care for them are not at risk of prosecution or extradition or being investigated. We need to do that work. We also need to make sure that we are, again, passing paid family and medical leave. We need to ensure that the folks who are working on reproductive liberty are heard in the, around the table, because it isn't just about our reproductive liberty amendment. It is about the erosion of our civil, civil liberties overall. And so I would say that while we have a um, pro-choice governor, we don't have a proactive governor and we are just not in a moment where we can be, we, where we can wait and see what happens next. We have to make sure that we are prepared for what happens next. And I think we all saw that in June and it would be a mistake for us not to act now. A pro-choice governor, but not a proactive governor. Yes. That's a great line. Um, governor Scott recently vetoed a bill to register contractors uh, and a bill to protect renters from unjust evictions amid a housing crisis. Would you comment on the differences between you and Governor Scott with respect to housing, including rental assistance and emergency assistance programs, keeping in mind that you've already commented a bit on housing? Thank you. So uh, when we slept in the state house steps for 28 nights, uh, 27 nights and 28 days, we had we were told right up until that last day that we weren't going to win, but we won because over 2000 people would have ended up on the street left to freeze to death. We have had two years to come up with a plan, more than two years to come up with a plan to for emergency, a short and long term plan for emergency, transitional and permanent housing. So I would say that the first difference between us is that I have a plan for housing. I have worked on it with uh, realtors, with builders, with people who are struggling to get into housing, with people experiencing homelessness, with folks who are trying to do upgrades to their home. And we have to make sure that regulations are part of the package. We also need to, you know, in Burlington, they're doing the pod housing. We need to replicate that across the state because we have an emergency situation right now. But we can't stop there because if we don't make a long term strategic investment in housing right now, then we continue to have this problem over and over and over again. And in fact, that long term economic impact on our state becomes huge. The long term impact on us not have has us having a worker shortage in the state becomes huge. And the um, burden of increasing homelessness because people cannot find affordable places to live becomes a huge problem. Thank you. Um, can you draw a distinction between you and Governor Scott on issues of transportation? So 
Uh, I'm going to start with electric vehicles. I think that there has to be a lot more done to make sure that low and moderate income families can access electric vehicles, in part because we don't have the public transportation infrastructure to build um, to, to ensure that people uh, can utilize public transportation in all of our rural communities. So the people that are driving the longest distances are often people who are struggling the most and cannot afford these vehicles. So that's one thing that we have to do. But then in public transportation, we need to make sure that we are expanding microtransit into these rural communities, that we're expanding our uh, education around public transportation. So something that's really missing when I sit on the Public Transit Advisory Commission is the education around public transportation. Once people understand that they can sit on their computer and do their work on a bus, um, then they're more apt and likely to use it. And we need to give these bus routes more than a year to work because it does take a while to change the culture. So that has to be part of this long-term strategic investment to make sure that we ensure that we get people to the ridership up in buses as well. So uh, this is a place where we have invested some because the federal government gave us the money to invest some in it. However, uh, it was not the priority it should have been prior to this. And so in my administration, it will be the priority uh, because the long-term economic impact of us doing this well uh, for the state is much is makes a positive growth in our state. Thank you. Uh, Governor Scott recently vetoed a bill for paid family leave, as you mentioned earlier. Would you comment on the differences between you and Governor Scott on issues of childcare and family matters? I 100% commit to uh, us getting to where families only pay 10% of their income towards childcare. I had to use our childcare system as a single mom. I know how critical it is for there to be adequate and robust childcare and after school care, in fact, uh, for families so that they can get to work. And, uh, and we need to make sure that we are doing that work, but we also need to intersect it with all of the issues um, that are coming up. And I, am, I need you to remind me what the other thing besides childcare I was supposed to talk about was. Family matters. Family matters in general. Uh, so, oh, paid family and medical leave. So um, I believe with that we have to, I don't just believe, we do have to move to paid family and medical leave, mandatory paid family and medical leave. Uh, the governor was happy to keep it as a voluntary option. Uh, by the way, it's already voluntary. Uh, and instead of actually ensuring that people are able to get on paid family medical leave. So that means that our lowest income earners would not ever be able to access that, uh, that benefit. And the people who need it the most are our lowest income earners. Uh, thank you. Can you talk about the differences between you and Governor Scott with respect to education at all levels? Sure. Uh, first of all, I believe in universal pre-K and we need to make sure that we are moving towards it. And I think a lot of harm has been done on that by just saying good enough is enough right now. It's not. We need universal pre-K for a variety of reasons in our state, uh, but there's lots of children who need that extra time in, the edu in our education system. In addition, we saw this year a very uh, prominent fight on pensions for our teachers. If we don't support our teachers in make sure that their pensions are the promise that we offered them, then we will not have the education system that we need. In fact, we saw a mass exit of teachers in the last several years, and that was a combination of how hard it was during COVID and how disrespectfully they were treated by this administration. And I would add that in our school systems, there is an equity issue, a geographic equity issue because of the way that we fund education. We need to make sure that we transition from property tax for education funding to a progressive income tax. That will make it so not only so that we have a better funding source for education, because only 25% of our education funding is residential property tax, but also it will make it more possible to have home ownership for those moderate income families, because that will take relieve a big portion of the tax burden. 
Thank you. Uh, Governor Scott recently vetoed a bill to begin decriminalizing drug possession and a bill to expand eligibility for expungement and the sealing of nonviolent records. Would you comment on how you would respond to such bills if you were governor? And if you'd like to get into issues regarding the opioid crisis uh, with respect to this question, please go ahead. So uh, three bills were vetoed this year. One was on expungement and it would give a slight expansion of exp uh, th crimes that were available for expungement. In addition, he vetoed a study on moving forward with removing criminal, pe criminal penalties and increasing access to treatment. Uh, and it was not an implementation, it was a study. And that was vetoed because of the study, which means that he didn't even want to learn more, nonetheless fix it. And then in addition, he vetoed the most major overdose crisis response bill that, that we have had. Uh, and that bill included increased expansion on medically assisted treatment, which is the way that we save lives with the overdose crisis, increased expansion of uh, sterile syringes, which is how we make sure that we are not, uh, that we are not spreading HIV and hepatitis C through our communities and make sure that people are more able to stay alive because they do not uh, get infections while they are wrought with this disease. And then it also included a study on overdose prevention sites or safe consumption sites as they're sometimes called. And again, the governor vetoed that bill because of a study. And I, for the life of me, cannot understand how you would veto a bill that increased access to treatment when we have ha when he has presided over the most deaths in the history of our state because of studies, because he didn't want to learn more. And what I would do is focus on harm reduction first, which includes things like sterile syringes, like fentanyl test strips, which fentanyl is in almost every uh, kind of opioid that is out there. Uh, that would include access to medically assisted treatment on demand and dual diagnosis support. And, we, and I would make sure that we're working on criminal justice reform, or as I recently heard uh, an officer call it, criminal justice uh, evolution. I think that's a really good way to say it because it is time for us to move forward on all of these issues. And we cannot continue down a path that has us burying our children. All right, thank you. Uh, criminal justice evolution. A sheriff candidate in Windsor County. <laughs> <laughs> um, healthcare uh, related question to the previous question. Uh, can you draw a distinction between uh, yourself and Governor Scott on issues surrounding healthcare? So we have to build a coalition with the states around us on many things, but one of them is healthcare. We have a lot more power to move towards a universal healthcare system if we build that coalition with the Democratic governors around us or any governors who are willing, but right now that would be the Democratic governors and the Democratic hopefuls that are around all around us. We need to make sure that we are in this state going to uh, universal primary care. And that universal primary care has to include dental, vision, and hearing, and mental health. Because right now, people cannot get the care that they need for all of those things. And I'm gonna include mental health even as a separate item, because right now, every time the budget comes out uh, from the governor's office, he doesn't include funding or appropriate funding for mental health services or for substance use disorder treatment. And so in order to have access to that, we have to make sure that we have the funding to give our healthcare providers what they need to make the field remain an attractive field, to make sure that they can do their jobs, that there are enough care providers so that people aren't waiting on waiting lists for six weeks, six months, two years. We've These all are happening right now in our state. And so if we want, I think most Vermonters ultimately want a Medicare for all type of system in the country. Right now, what's happening in the US government, it's gonna be difficult for us to move forward. And so we have to do what we can to move forward here in the state. And that includes building this coalition with the states around us. Thank you. 
Uh, Governor Scott recently vetoed a bill to keep firearms out of hospitals, and this came about amid a national reckoning on gun violence. Would you comment on your position on gun reform and uh, let us know how that differs from uh, the position of Governor Scott? We need to make sure that we ban military style assault rifles, people killers. Uh, we need to make sure that we are increasing our waiting period so that uh, in the 88% of gun violence that happens in our state is actually suicide. And we need to make sure that those folks have a, a pause where they can try to access treatment before they go and purchase a gun. Uh, and we need to uh, fully close the Charleston loophole because 10 days is not enough. Across the country, children are being executed in school and people are being executed in parades and at malls and all at concerts. And it is only a matter of time before something like that happens here in Vermont. So we have to, we have, to have our uh, laws ready to go again. This is not a wait and see moment. This is not an issue where it's okay to wait and see. We have to move forward and be proactive. Thank you. Um, you've already talked a bit about climate change. Is there anything you'd like to add to uh, your response to the question about the differences between you and Governor Scott on climate change? Uh, and uh, we could just add to that uh, women's rights and reproductive rights. Uh, there's, there's, I have a 10 point plan on reproductive liberty that I will, um, that maybe we can include in the comments. It has, we have an, an image graphic that has it. We also have uh, somewhere on Instagram that hopefully Paige Diana can, can put into the comments. Uh, there is a, um, a screenshot of the, or a photograph of, of the entire plan, all 10 points. Uh, and then, uh, so that you can all see it, but we do have to, we have to do the work to be ready for the moment that we're in on reproductive liberty. And then on climate, we have to understand we're not gonna do this one electric vehicle at a time. We need to increase access to public transportation. We need to make sure that we are uh, updating our public utilities commission so that we can build in-state renewable energy. We need to support our small farms in transitioning to carbon sequestration and require our large farms to do the same. Cleaning up our waterways needs to become a strong priority and we need to make sure that there are climate scientists working in the administration to, uh, so that we can meet our climate goals. Okay. Well, thank you, Brenda. Uh, that really brings us to the end of uh, questions. Thank you so much for coming uh, to let us all know about your platform and let us meet you. I really appreciate you making the time for us tonight.